On Adélie land, part of the Antarctic continent claimed by France, the permanent scientific base du mont durville is sited on the coast just two kilometers from a colony of emperor penguins. Thanks to this proximity, researchers now possess a profound knowledge of the species. The story of the emperor penguin, of which only the biological outline and adaptation can be sketched in this film, is one of the most extraordinary in all the animal kingdom. While in the Northern Hemisphere, the month of March announces the arrival of spring, in the Southern Hemisphere, on Adélie land and throughout the Antarctic continent, millions of marine birds have already abandoned the coast where they had come to breed during the brief austral summer. The coast returns once more to a lifeless desert. The temperature begins its long descent below freezing. The sea turns to ice, and little by little the ice flows take shape for an interminable nine-month winter. This is the very time, however, that the whole emperor penguin population chooses to come ashore. Marching in long columns on the ice flows, these extraordinary flightless birds are the only living creatures to arrive here in the very heart of the bleak polar winter for the climax of their yearly reproductive cycle. The Paradox of the Emperors. The colony of emperor penguins at Pointe Géologie comprises 6,000 individuals. But other colonies comprise over 100,000 birds. Each colony camps on the coastal ice flows in the same spot every year. The males are bigger than the females, standing about 1.2 meters high and weighing up to 45 kilos at their arrival. For many months, the emperors are going to face a severe fast, forced to draw on their reserves of body fat. They will quench their thirst by eating snow. Curiously, these birds do not make nests, nor do they claim a certain territory. Upon arrival, they begin their nuptial displays with a calling song to attract the partner. This call is a sign of identification for the species and also for the sex. Even in such a hubbub, no confusion is possible because only one call by a single bird silences all its neighbors within a radius of up to seven meters. In fact, each emperor must await his turn to call. Unique among birds, the emperors become completely silent from the moment they pair to the time of egg laying. As the partners have no nest, they communicate and take their bearings only by posturing. The penguin's rolling gait allows each bird to keep its partner in view among a multitude of seemingly identical individuals. From time to time, one of a pair will break the law of silence. Immediately, an unpaired bird is attracted by the call and disrupts the couple who have no territorial barrier to protect them. But the trio do not make a happy family, and the outcome is often an eventual separation of the original pair. The couple's continued silence is therefore of paramount importance if they are to breed successfully. In addition, 
The pair must harmonize their activities quickly because penguins have only a limited reserve of energy and on the ice flows every day counts. Ecstatic posturing favors synchronization and in less than three weeks all the couples are formed. In the absence of a nest, the couples scatter at random over the ice. It's the beginning of May. Slowly, day by day, the winter gains ground. The temperature is already 20 degrees below freezing. The sun will soon disappear for many months. This is the moment when the females lay their eggs. Just one egg is laid directly onto the bird's feet. It will incubate there, and the emperor will carry it by balancing on its heels. For such a large bird, the egg appears small. It weighs only one pound. After laying, the birds resume their calling, but this time in duets. The call is a unique password for the couple which must come together again after long intervals. Each emperor possesses a special call recognizable by its partners. Before the first departure of the females, the couples listen to each other with the greatest attention. Weakened by egg laying and by two months of starvation, the female entrusts her egg to the more resilient male. Barring an accident, the egg will not be separated from him until hatching. He alone will carry it for the following two months. But the transfer is a delicate operation which some couples do not achieve and the egg abandoned on the ice freezes very quickly. One quarter of all the eggs laid annually are lost in this way. As soon as the females are free, they can at last leave to feed themselves in the sea beyond the ice flows, which now extend up to 200 kilometers from the coast and are over two meters thick. Twenty hour nights, extreme cold, and the threat of blizzards descending regularly from the continent. The males are now alone, confronting the most terrible winter on the planet. The fact that they are able to face 
these rigorous conditions is due to remarkably effective insulation provided by their watertight plumage and their enormous reserves of fat. The egg, sunk in a fold of the belly, remains well protected from the violent cold. Despite their extraordinary thermal protection, the penguins would not survive for long if they did not huddle together in tight groups. Packed into a space of 10 birds per square meter, they considerably reduce their heat loss and therefore their expenditure of energy. For the emperors, this is without doubt their most fundamental adaptation to the cold. It is by losing their territorial barriers during their evolution and by using the flat ground of the ice flow that they have vanquished the polar cold and have achieved the incredible feat of reproducing in the Antarctic winter. July, in the very heart of winter, the first chicks appear. The females, absent for the last two months, return at last to take over from the males. As soon as they arrive, they call for their partner. Some hours later, the pair is united again. The chick receives its first meal of fish. Then the mother takes it under her care. But the males are now in their fourth month of fasting. They have lost close to half of their body weight and they're near exhaustion. The ocean, only two meters beneath their feet, cannot nourish them here. They may have to cross several hundreds of kilometers on the ice flows before reaching the open sea and being able at last to obtain food. Little by little, the days grow longer, but the cold is no less intense. Well nourished and remarkably well protected by their mother, the chicks quickly increase in size. The colony stays close to the islands that anchor the ice flow. They will serve as a refuge and save the progeny from being engulfed should the ice break up in a storm. The beginning of September. The chicks are six weeks old and begin to brave the cold. They are now big enough to venture from the parents' incubation pocket 
where the temperature is a constant 30 degrees above freezing, into a climate that can reach minus 30 degrees centigrade. This is a dangerous time for the chicks. In the absence of a nest and of a territorial barrier, a young chick runs the risk of being seized by neighboring parents who have lost their own young. It might then die, crushed in a battle among kidnappers. If the chick is spared in the course of an abduction, its adoptive parent rapidly loses interest in it and more often than not abandons it. The chick generally finishes by dying of cold. Thus, although one might expect adoption to benefit survival, in fact, it rarely succeeds. But this is not the only danger for the adventurous young. Attacks by the recently arrived giant petrels are, however, very rare. The end of September, the males return to take over again from the females. The days grow longer, but the intense cold persists, and the blizzards, more violent than ever, cause large numbers of casualties among the less well-nourished young. Those who survive continue to grow. The ice flow begins to recede. To fulfill the ever greater demands of their chick, the parents now ceaselessly shuttle back and forth to and from the open sea. In the absence of adults, the young regroup in creches. These might be regarded as forerunners of the tightly packed groupings made by the adults. On their return, the parents call in front of the creches until their offspring appear. Once a chick has been identified, the parent will stay with it and feed it until it is satisfied. October, the first signs of the austral spring. The surviving chicks are in robust health and now out of danger. Long fissures appear in the ice flow as it begins to break up. These are immediately exploited by Weddell seals which haul out on the ice.
The emperors are no longer alone. They come across their first Adélie penguins, very much smaller, which arrive to reproduce in the short Antarctic summer. Among the rocks, the Cape pigeons uncover their nests of the previous summer. They also profit from this brief season to reproduce. With November and its long sunny days, the ice flow is transformed into a pestilent slew of melting ice and debris accumulated over many months. It's the time of the big thaw. The sun and the marine currents eat away the ice from all sides, and the swell dislodges immense rafts of pack ice, which go adrift. The little Adélie penguins become more and more numerous. Generally, among the animal species, the larger their size, the longer it takes to raise the young. The imposing emperor does not escape this rule. Only by standing up to the polar winter and the frozen ocean can it obtain the time and the space necessary for its reproduction. Isolated on the ice flow for eight months, the parents have now fulfilled their contract and leave for the open ocean for four months to reconstitute their reserves. Having lost its ability to fly, the species has acquired a superlative ability to swim. Its adaptation to the aquatic environment is remarkable. The chicks rest a while in the company of the last adults. The day is now 24 hours long and temperatures approach zero degrees. In this mild weather, compared to the conditions they've been through, the young suffer severely from the heat. December, the Antarctic summer. The chicks are now five months old and weigh 10 kilos. With their first molt, they experience their first period of fasting. There will be many others throughout a lifespan which may attain 30 years. At last, the chicks depart in the middle of the thaw. In five years, when they have matured, they also will come back to reproduce. The evolution of this species in so extreme an environment has demanded a convergence of the most sophisticated adaptations. The emperor penguin has succeeded in uniting its nine-month period of reproduction with the long austral winter. And we have witnessed, not a paradox of nature, but an elegant and original solution to a seemingly insoluble problem of survival of the species. A varied show tomorrow with a selection of the Antarctic seals and birds, but penguins still get a look.